Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Sports Medicine Concepts Sports Emergency Care White Paper Session. Today we'll be going over management of the equipment-laden hockey player. I welcome everybody to this session. My name is Mike Sandoma, and I'll be today's moderator. I'm the program director at Sports Medicine Concepts, and oftentimes the host of this uh, this program, the white paper sessions. Um, but today we have uh, a guest speaker who has a little bit more expertise in the hockey realm than I do thought, so I thought it would be appropriate to step back and be the moderator for today's session and allow uh, someone with a little more expertise in the hockey realm uh, to present today's materials. So before we get started, I'd like to welcome everybody to sport, the Sports Emergency Care White Paper Series. Uh, during this session, we'll be reviewing current trends in management of the equipment-laden hockey player. And as you'll notice in your participation pane, you'll find links to important ancillary materials uh, and, and references for today's program. So uh, what I would do is, is welcome you to sit back and, and listen to today's presentation. And then when you have an opportunity, uh, review those, uh, those ancillary materials that are in the materials section. Those will come to you in an email as well. So you'll have links to those uh, documents that we've provided for you to provide some supporting materials, some interesting uh, research from the peer review, uh, and, and other uh, interesting reads that support the uh, information that we've provided for you today. As a BOC approved provider, we are able to offer one category A CEU for those of you participating in this live event. This session is recorded and will be available for review from our website and YouTube channel, but only those taking part live are eligible for CEUs. All registered participants who meet the attendance criteria will receive a certificate of completion in the program's follow-up email. Uh, this email will come to you within 24 hours of, of program completion. So keep an eye on your email for that. If you don't see it within 24 hours, make sure you check your spam folder. Uh, make sure it's not hidden in there somewhere. And if you have a, a, an issue with that, please feel free to contact me at any time, and I'll make sure that you get all, all of the required information that you need. So how to participate in today's uh, program, like all of our other white paper series, we, we like to try and keep this pretty simple for you. Uh, I know if you're anything like the rest of us in, in the athletic training world, uh, we probably have a pretty busy evening lined up between basketball, hockey, or whatever other sports you work in this winter. So it's nice just to kick back maybe for, uh, for the afternoon and let someone else do the work. So you can let us do that. Um, but there are some things uh, I should uh, key you into as far as uh, the participation pane that is on the right-hand side of your screen. By clicking the orange arrow, you can open and close that control panel, as you'll see here shown on, on the slide here. So if you click that red arrow, we can open and close your uh, control panel for you. From the view menu uh, item across the top of that control panel, you can also set the control panel to not auto hide when it's inactive if you prefer to keep it always open. Uh, the audio pane provides audio information and by default you've joined uh, the webinar by microphone and speaker. Click the audio setup to select your computer speakers or headsets. Uh, I would assume that none of you are having those issues. Uh, or we would have heard probably from you by now. But if you prefer, you can join the audio via telephone by selecting Use Telephone. Uh, and the dial-in information, including the audio pane, uh, the audio pin, excuse me, will, will show up in that uh, part of your control panel. If you would like to ask us any questions uh, for today's presenter over, uh, over the phone, you must enter your audio pin in order to have your line uh, unmuted so that we can uh, hear those questions when it comes to the question and answer session. Uh, but most of our questions will be saved or reserved for the end of the presentation. So it's best if you if you look in the control panel, you'll see where there's a question uh, pane uh, window there. If you type in your questions there as the moderator, I'll be watching for those questions coming in as Mr. McCabe has given his presentation. And uh, time permitting, at the end of the program, we'll pose those questions to, uh, to Pete, and, and he can provide his insight into uh, answering any questions that you might have. So 
So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Pete McCabe. Uh, Pete is, serves as a primary uh, instructor for sports medicine concepts in our In Two Minutes or Less program uh, and has done so for a number of years. Uh, Pete's expertise in particular with, with teaching the program is the insight that he can offer uh, that comes from his uh, primary job as an athletic trainer at Nazareth College where he's primarily responsible for working with the ice hockey program at Naz College. So I'm going to uh, turn the presentation over to Mr. McCabe here in a minute. So as I as I do that, it'll take me just a minute to make Pete the presenter. And now we'll turn that over to Mr. McCabe so he can give us uh, today's presentation. And again, please remember, if questions arise during the presentation, please uh, type those into the chat room. And, uh, and we'll answer those questions at the end. So without further ado, Mr. McKay. Can everyone hear me okay? Mike, can you hear me? Yes, we've got you. All right, sorry about that. I had a little issue there with uh, getting unmuted here. All right, so uh, Mike, thanks for the introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, just to kind of follow up, as Mike said, um, I am working as a, a primary athletic trainer for our men's ice hockey team at Nazareth College. Uh, Nazareth is located up in uh, Rochester, New York, for those of you uh, who may not be familiar with the school. Uh, the school itself actually is um, very young in, in in the uh, ice hockey realm. I'm actually in the fifth year um, as an athletic trainer here with ice hockey. I came here uh, for the reason of working with the ice hockey team um, and was you know, very excited when NAS started the program back in 2012. So um, I've been here since and as Mike said I've traveled around with him and, and done various work with him um, with sports medicine concepts and again Mike thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, present some information. So what we're going to discuss here today, everybody, is um, a little bit of a review of certain considerations um, that we have for sports, or excuse me, for equipment in ice hockey. All right, not just are we going to talk about the various equipment that ice hockey has, because obviously it varies greatly from other sports like football and lacrosse, although some some equipment uh, may be similar. Um, but how exactly are we going to get that that equipment off the person when we need to? Um, also, how is this emergency, or excuse me, how is this equipment going to cause certain problems with emergency management? Uh, that's very important that we know this. Um, so, when worst case scenario comes, we we already have a plan as to how we're going to deal with the equipment. And we're not trying to figure things out uh, when the situation arises. And also, different variations. There's lots of different variations, as with a lot of other sports. Um, hockey equipment can vary um, differently um, from person to person, player to player. Um, so a lot of their um, equipment will change, so it's important to know different variations. Uh, and we're also going to talk a little bit about different scenarios that present themselves, both with the man out position, so that could be a forward or defender, uh, and then also the goalie position. And within that, we're going to talk a little bit about our primary objectives, which are going to drive everything we do at all times in emergency situations. We'll talk a little bit about those in a few. Uh, but we'll also pr I'll present this to you in situations where we have a stable person, all right, that we hope happens most of the time, and then those non-stable situations that are obviously uh, more dire and where time becomes more, more critical. All right, so quick critical care facts for you. So the first one is no piece of emergency response equipment can alone guarantee an outcome. I got a picture over here of um, my orange crash kit that I have with me uh, during all of our practices. Um, I do have EMTs at the college level. I have EMTs that are with me on game days, so we don't have to worry about um, having this stuff on us during game days as much. Um, but it's very important that everybody is familiar with all the different pieces of equipment that 
make your emergency action plan. You need to be familiar with the functionality of everything, whether it's the AED, whether it's your manual suction unit, whether it's a, you know, a wrist blood pressure cuff, whatever you may have at your disposal to help in an emergency situation, it's vital that you know how to use it. All right, The proper application, proper maintenance and taking care, and knowing its specific role in the critical care situations. Uh, this is a presentation we did in Geneseo um, with Mike, and you can see uh, his red bags or his emergency bags are always there, so we have all the equipment we may need in all these different situations. Critical care fact number two, don't use any equipment that has not already been properly integrated into your emergency action plan. Pretty much makes a lot of sense. You know, we wouldn't want to start using something on the first day when, you know, when again that situation presents itself when all different things could be happening at once. You want to make sure that everything that's in your emergency action plan, all the equipment you have is properly integrated so that when something happens, you know how you're going to incorporate it in that response. All right. So its role in the critical care management is important. Specific protocols need to be stated. Uh, and also those psychomotor skills uh, need to be acquired, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, critical care fact number three, vital psychomotor emergency response skills and cognitive knowledge are essential. And I can't go over enough how, how much this is important. Every year we, we put together a, um, for ice hockey, uh, a get together with our EMTs, our doctors, my student workers, our sports management team, and we, we go over all these different things that may happen. All right, and the reason why we go over these things is to develop these psychomotor and cognitive, um, you know, ideas, so that when things happen again, we're not, you know, left there wondering, should we have done this? Could we do this? We want to have a plan for every different situation, so that when something happens, if you're at Bill Gray's Regional Ice Plex in Rochester, New York, where we have all of our home games, you know, everything is going to run as smoothly as possible. And with that comes annual rehearsals. Uh, according to the NATA, we should all be rehearsing our EAPs for a minimum of 15 hours annually, which seems like a lot of time, and for athletic trainers, time is definitely not something we always have on our side, but uh, when it comes to emergency situations, you know, coaches put their hands up, the AD puts their hands up, parents, everyone's looking at us to make sure that we're the ones that are, you know, doing the right things and, um, you know, having the plan of action in those emergency situations. So. You know, I can't stress enough how important it is to practice these skills, and especially in a in a sport like ice hockey, where, as you can see on the slide here, you know, you got ice. That's the the one thing that's different with ice hockey than any other sport is the the you know, what we're playing on or what we're walking on or trying to run on. So it's just very important that we rehearse these skills and make sure that we are adequately prepared uh, for any of the situations that may arise. And critical care fact number five. Uh, these skills must be part of an efficient EAP okay, and simulated practice. Kind of goes back to number four, but it's important to practice what you're doing. Here's a picture right here this, just this year of uh, a get-together, like I said, we had with our EMTs going over everything, just making sure that on game days I'm on the same page as um, the men and women that are there to uh, help me out in emergency situations. All right, to kind of get into uh, what I'm here to talk about, I'm going to try not to move very fast. Um, if, I, if I do speak fast, as Mike said before, please be sure to type in some questions for me, or if I brush over anything, please type any questions or save them to the end, and we can discuss um, at the end. But I kind of want to move along, because I have a lot of information I want to share with everybody. But to start off, the man out, or again, the forward, or our defender right here, versus our goalie equipment. Just by looking at it, you can see there's very, very many uh, differences in both equipment. All right. Some differences are more obvious than others, uh, but some might not be. So at this point, we're going to talk a little bit about man-out equipment and some of the considerations we need to take uh, with that equipment. So starting off at the very top with the helmet. The hockey helmet um, it comes in various different looks. All right, This helmet that we have right here is actually a Bauer 4500. Uh, it's, a, it's a very common helmet. Um, I was talking to some of our coaches about it actually just recently, and it, it's a helmet that's getting phased out to a certain extent. Uh, like football helmets, models of uh, hockey helmets come out all the time. Um, so it's important to know what helmet your athletes are using uh, for various reasons. Um, one is uh, obviously the look of it. Okay, So some of them have this bubble, which is on the right side here. It's just a plastic clear uh, guard that's on the front part of the face. But then you also have your more traditional um, cage that's on the front. All right. 
whether you have the cage or whether you have the bubble, uh, the, the attachments are all the same. Okay, you're going to have two screws that are at the very top. All right, they hold the face mask in place, and then they, it swings down freely. So it goes from here and up, and they're, they're secured uh, either via a button strap and Velcro or some combination of both uh, to the face mask and then to the helmet. All right, so it's, it's very important to know what you're working with because you know, if you have to either deal with the helmet, take the mask off, whatever may, situation may present itself, it's important to know what you're working with. Uh, does the helmet fit correctly? That's kind of the main uh, you know, take home point for I, I, I think personally uh, dealing with hockey helmets. When you read the literature about you know, do we leave the helmet on or do we take it off in certain situations, a lot of it's going to depend on the fit of that helmet. I can tell you right now just by watching practices, uh, a lot of our guys, the helmets don't really fit all that great. And again, if we compare it to the football helmet, where the football helmet typically fits nice and snug, the hockey helmet, you know, it, it's questionable how, how well it fits. So when it comes to considerations with hockey helmets, or, and we'll get to it here in a second, about, you know, getting to the airway, do we take the mask off like we do in football? Or what do we do in those different situations? Now, the masks themselves can be removed, but I do warn you to make sure that those top screws are all maintained appropriately. I can't tell you how many times guys will come up to me, hey, can you just tighten up my face mask a little bit? And you go to screw it, and it's just spinning. So as with any piece of equipment, it needs to be well maintained, and any sort of equipment that may be spinning, stripped, you know, rusted, those things should all be fixed because uh, when it comes to taking them off, you don't want to run into any situations. However, uh, with the sport of ice hockey, and we'll talk a little bit more about that with the shoulder pads, uh, we can kind of discuss a little bit about, you know, what, what's the best case scenario? Should we take the face mask off, or should the whole hat come off? A lot of that will depend on the helmet fit. All right. Uh, it's not re recommended, as with football, to flip this up and leave it up. If we do have a situation where we need immediate airway access, that is okay. Uh, but inevitably, just with football, if you're taking one piece off, it's usually very important to continue to take off everything else. I like to throw in, and what's a hockey presentation without some blood? Uh, we have this picture here of just kind of a, an example of it's nice that our guys are wearing our cages in the NCAA, but I, it happens all the time where guys will get hit in the face and you know they get all sorts of lacerations and stuff to their chin. So um, please bear with me. I hope no one is squeamish when it comes to bloody pictures. I don't have anything too bad in here, but there are a couple pictures that I wanted to throw in to show everybody. All right, some other upper body considerations as far as the forward or the defender position um, requires. All right, our shoulder pads. Uh, the, it's very important, uh, as with the helmets, it's very important that we know what different shoulder pads all of our players have on. Okay, they don't vary that greatly. Uh, one of the main variations that I see um, is sizing. As you can see, this, these uh, shoulder pads do a nice job to cover his entire AC joint, his entire shoulder on both sides. I have had um, hockey players in the past that have a variation of this pad, but it's almost like no padding at all. Um, it, it, it's a lot smaller, the shoulder pads don't come down as far, and we find this a lot with our forwards that want to have a lot of shoulder mobility. Uh, they'll tend to kind of want to push their shoulder pads or not have as much protection on their shoulders. And for obvious reasons, we, don't want, we want to make sure that that's not happening. Um, so make sure that you, you check out all your, your players and make sure you know what they're wearing and where all the certain straps are on their pads. For the shoulder pads themselves, um, for the man out, so for the defender or for the or for the forward, these pe these straps are typically very um, very thin. They're not very hard to cut, um, but they're located usually in, in in four different areas. You'll always have a Velcro strap that wraps from the back, so starting here and then to the front and secures here. Okay, we'll also have straps that wrap around the shoulders and kind of hold the shoulder pads down on the bicep. If we need to remove this, we can cut this here. And cut this here, all right. And even by just cutting these two here to get immediate um, chest access, the whole thing will flip up, all right. But it's important in a situation where we're making sure we're removing all equipment. All straps need to make sure that they're they're um, you know cut, so we're not getting anything caught when we're trying to remove it, all right. But and, but for most of these pads too, like I said, they're very thin. I mean, if you really had to, if you had a good pair of shears, you might be able to go down the middle of this, but 
I would highly recommend. Check out the straps and know where your straps are on your athlete so uh, you can take these off uh, much more efficiently than cutting down the middle. All right, additional upper body padding that a lot of our guys or most forwards and defenders will wear uh, are elbow pads, okay? Uh, these elbow pads are a little bit different than um, some of the elbow pads uh, that other guys wear. The main difference with these is they get longer or they get shorter. And you can see, um, you'll see it in the next picture here, but we, th he doesn't have any gloves on in this picture, but there's a nice big space here between uh, where his elbow pads and his, his gloves begin. So uh, the forearm is a, an interesting area that you, know, you need to make sure you're, you're careful about uh, because that's an area that's very exposed to block shots, um, slashes. We see it a lot uh, with our face-off guys. Uh, you know, some guys will come up and they'll, they'll actually hit them uh, right on the wrist of their forearm. So additional padding can be added to not these um, elbow pads specifically here, but there are other elbow pads uh, that do have wrist attachments on them um, in the event that, you know, your athlete may be getting in the wrist more than, more than not. And the only other variation that I, I want to point out here before I move on to the next slide uh, is um, suspenders. Occasionally some of the guys will have suspenders. Uh, and this picture doesn't look like uh, doesn't look like he has him, but sometimes there will be suspenders that go up and around the shoulder. You'll see with our goalie as we talk about our goalie position, they are much more common in the goalie than they are in the man out position. But be, be aware of that. You need to make sure you know what athletes are wearing what, because um, in the event you got to remove something, you got to know what you're cutting and when you're cutting it. All right. As we move on, and actually really quick, I want to throw this in there. This is a, a, last, a nice good laceration we had uh, two years ago. And I want to throw this in here because this gives a, a really good perspective. It's actually not the same person, even though he has the, a nice, nice cut here in almost the same area as that. It's not the same person, though. Uh, but it's important to note that space in between in the abdomen area is, is very exposed um, for different things, um, you know, including but not limited to lacerations. But we do see a lot of... Um, rib contusions, uh, whether they're hitting the boards, hit blocking a puck, this area is very, very exposed as well as the forearm um, on the man out position uh, just because of the minimal padding that's in that place. And this is the before and this is these all stitched up afterwards. Other equipment uh, that we want to make sure we talk about uh, today, um, we talked about our gloves a little bit so you can kind of see his his elbow pad's a little bit longer than the one we just discussed, but you can see there's a nice space between his wrist and the, and the glove here. Um, so that's a, an important area to make sure that you're aware of. Um, but along with the gloves or the pants, as I mentioned, some of the pants are held up with um, suspenders, not always. Uh, these pants aren't as thick as our goalies are for obvious reasons, uh, but it's, it's pr pretty thick padding. Uh, but if we continue to go down, uh, we have our, our shin protectors that all of our guys wear. Uh, they're very similar to the elbow pads. Um, but a, again, a very, very um, essential piece of equipment that will actually protect the front part of the shin here, but it also wraps around and protects the back as well. All right. Um, it's important to know the setup, how the socks go on, how the tape is put on, because the guys will put tape on their socks to make sure their socks stay up. It's important to know this stuff because um, in certain situations, if you've got to get to the lower body, typically for lacerations, you've got to make sure you know what you're cutting and what, you know, what needs to be cut. I bring up a point. Uh, we had a situation, it was actually my first year here, back in 2012, one of our defenders uh, was checked into the boards. As he was hit into the boards, it was kind of a weird situation. He, the guy who hit him kind of jumped up in the air. As he jumped up into the air, the guy on the other team who hit him, his skate went inside the boot of our player's skate here. All right. This is uh, a nice shot of the actual, this is the lateral aspect of the ankle right here. So he was very lucky. He was millimeters. You can see after he got stitched up, he was very, very close to his Achilles tendon. But it was one of those situations where, one, you need to be prepared for blood at all times um, in the sport of hockey. But um, just lower body-wise, you want to make sure you're very prepared and understand how you're going to get through this equipment uh, to access and control bleeding in these situations. Um, this defender here that I was just speaking about, he was out for a while because actually as a defender he skated backwards a lot um, and that pressure on the ankle actually opened up the wound um, and kept it open longer than we really wanted it to. But he ended up coming back and playing just fine. Um, but just very important to note uh, how to get this equipment off. And then lastly, as we, we work our way down the man out player, uh, we have their skates. Uh, the skates for a man out position, forward or defender, uh, they vary greatly with the, with the goalie, and we'll talk about that in a second. 
But one of the main things that the man out position has that the goalie doesn't is this piece right here. It's designed to help protect the Achilles tendon while also giving some support to the posterior aspect of the ankle. Um, but in most situations, um, it is used to protect the Achilles tendon. Um, but in general, the skates are pretty consistent across the board. Most of our guys wear the same type of skates, vapors, um, et cetera. So uh, they're very consistent. But again, knowing what you have and what you're working with is very, very important when it comes to uh, working with these, these athletes or any equipment intensive athletes for that matter. All right, now we'll jump, uh, jump off the, the man out position. We'll talk a little bit about our goaltenders. Uh, this is one variation of the mask. Uh, for lack of better terms, they refer to it as a traditional goaltender mask. Uh, the face mask can be removed with a screwdriver, uh, but it's not recommended, and I'll kind of explain a little bit why. Uh, the, you can see there's screws that attach here to the both sides and then also to the bottom. There are no screws that attach to the top of this mask. Uh, but if we turn, turn it around and look at the back, um, we have five different straps that connect a, a back plate or a cup would probably be a better way to describe it because of its convex shape. Uh, but it sits in the posterior aspect of the, the helmet. And while the face mask can be removed with this helmet, it most likely if we have to remove the face mask, this is going to be your quicker alternative to get that done. All right, because by quickly snipping off, or again, if it's a stable situation, we can unclip. A lot of our ADs like it when we unclip things and don't cut things, um, especially with our goaltenders. But uh, we want to remove these five straps, and basically the whole top part of here will lift right up. Okay, and then basically this will sit right on the back part of the athlete if he or she was in the supine position on the ice. All right, so quickest, most efficient way to get the helmet off of a traditional style helmet for a goalie would be this way I would recommend. Um, I would definitely stay away from playing with these screws. Um, again, just from the aspect of time, it, it is always better to, uh, to aid on the side of quicker, especially um, in emergency situations. I want to bring up this picture too because I apologize, it's not terribly zoomed in. This goes back to 2012. This was actually our, our inaugural game our first game, um, but we beat Geneseo, which I was pretty pretty stoked about, our first game ever. But the, the point I want to bring up is the, the type of helmet that, um, that our goalie here is, is wearing. Um, as, as compared to a traditional style helmet like I showed you here, this Hashik style helmet um, is very interesting and, and, and poses some, some different considerations um, that the traditional goalie helmet does not. Uh, this helmet, the Hashik style, is actually very similar to um, our man out. If, if you look very closely, actually, the, the helmet's exactly the same. The only difference here is we threw a oversized um, and a more durable uh, face mask on the front part of, of, of his of mask here. Uh, but when it comes down to removing it, I don't know if unscrewing it's the best way to do it. Again, a lot of it depends on the fit of the helmet. Uh, but just want to put it out there that there are different types of styles of helmets that the goalies may wear. Uh, and while this helmet's not as common anymore, um, they are definitely out there. All right, so as we kind of shed off the jersey and talk about some uh, the upper body pads of our goalies specifically, uh, well, I want to start kind of up top. Very important that our goalies are wearing our throat protectors. Uh, I know it's it's I believe it's uh, mandated for um, for the younger kids coming up the ranks in hockey, but our goalies need to be wearing these at all times, um, obvious for obvious reasons, protecting the neck and all the different vascular. Um, structures that are there. Uh, we want to make sure that our goalies are wearing those at all times. Um, similar to uh, the man out position, our goalies are wearing shoulder pads. Uh, very, very different, obviously, size-wise, and for obvious reasons. They're very thick um, and much bigger and bulkier than our man out position. Um, and what's interesting about the goalie pads themselves is their elbow pads are actually all connected to their shoulder pads. So while the man out position will put their elbow pads on separately, our goalies kind of put on this big suit all together um, prior to going out onto the ice. Um, as I mentioned before, what's very, very typical with our, our goalies is these suspenders. These suspenders help pull up, hold up their pants. Um, all of our goalies on our team and, and all goalies that I've, I've run into all have suspenders that hold their pants up so they're not messing around with those while they're in goal. Plus with the up-down motions that they have, um, they, they typically need those more than the man out position would. As we turn our focus to the posterior aspect um, of these pads, um, it's important to note the straps are almost in the same locations as with our man out position, 
but as I mentioned with the man out position, those uh, straps are very thin and easily cut. These ones, as you, especially the ones up top, they're very difficult to get off. Um, so you got to know your goalies. You got to know what they're wearing. Um, even field hockey. I look at the field hockey goalies all the time. You want to make sure you know what different pads these athletes are wearing because when it comes to taking them off, it makes it that much easier, that much quicker if you know where every aspect is that you need to cut. All right. So make sure you know that. Um, as I drift down here to uh, the posterior aspect of the goalie's legs, lower legs, this is probably the most vulnerable area of the goalie, or one of the most vulnerable area. Uh, the, the, the pads, the lower, uh, the lower body pads themselves wrap around and they're attached by leather um, and Velcro straps, uh, but it leaves the calf very exposed. So you've got to be very careful. If you, if you see your, your goalies go down in you know, the prone position, I always worry about them getting stepped on. Uh, this is a very vulnerable spot for them. Um, so you got to make sure you know that when treating them. Um, what's not pictured here, and I'll show you a, a picture of that here in a second, um, is the way that the, the blockers themselves, the lower body blockers, are attached to the skate. So as you can see here, and what many people don't know, is when you get a goalie down in the, in the prone position and you're looking to take these straps off, uh, you want to make sure not only do you take off those Velcro and the leather straps that I talked about, but there's also some, um, some hockey lace that will, it attaches to the front part of their lower body pads, and it, depending on the goalie, because they all do different things, some of them do crazier things than others, uh, but they all kind of, they'll, they'll tie them off in different locations. I, I, most of the time we see our guys tying them off towards the front, um, but sometimes I've seen them interlaced all the way back down the toque, which is this uh, white part of the skate here. Um, but it secures the um, the actual blocker to the to the skate. So it's very important as we're dealing with our goalies um, in an emergency situation. You need to remember that these are not the only areas where these pads are attached. You need to remember that we need to make sure we cut these off as well. All right. And the last point I want to make, and I apologize, they're not pictured here. A very important piece of equipment that our goalies have on at all times, and it's hiding right behind the top of his blocker here, or his lower body pad, and that's a little knee pad. Um, if if uh, this guy was to drop down in the what we call the butterfly position where he's on his knees, this pad here actually opens up and exposes the, um, the superior aspect of his knee. And it's very important. We want to make sure we protect that. So there are knee pads that are behind here. So when the athlete goes down, he has protection over that front part of his knee as well. Other equipment considerations that we didn't talk about, just want to bring up, here's that bucket style Hashik helmet again. This one, same goalie, uh, a couple, I think it was the following year, he got a nice, nicer looking helmet. I love the, the logos and stuff these guys uh, designed for their helmets. But um, again, it's very similar to the man out position helmet. The only difference is uh, the helmet itself is uh, a bit more reinforced compared to the similar man out helmets. And for obvious reasons, we want to make sure those shells are, are, are ready to take an impact at all times. Uh, but if we go down, other equipment, we got our blocker on this side. He's got his glove, um, you know, just some different, um, different pieces of equipment that we didn't, we didn't talk about prior. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit about man-out scenarios and goalie scenarios. So we're going to talk about different situations that you may be in and, you know, what are the best ways to um, kind of solve those different problems or those different issues. And, again, because we want to make sure we do these in the most, um, you know, organized, but also the quickest ways possible. Okay, we're going to talk about uh, how we're going to get someone from the prone position to the supine position. Now, keep in mind, for all you that want to jump in, we'll just call this a stable, a stable condition right now. This person's talking to you, you know, you know, he may be describing, you know, some cervical spine things to you that you're kind of questioning, but you're going to take all the precautions you can to make sure that we, we, we or excuse me, transfer this person to the, the supine position as safely as possible. What we find and what research shows is, I mean, the flat, the flat lift, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a little bit, is often regarded as the best way to move an athlete. Uh, however, and research does support that with minimal movement to the cervical spine, but, you know, anyone that's been on ice, anyone that's been out there uh, with, you know, little to no help, whether you have student workers or EMTs at your games or not, you know, how realistic is a flat lift going to be for a person on ice? Uh, you know, and then you start throwing in, you know, a real big goalie or a, a really tall defender, 
you know, I, I'm, I'm not sold on the flat lift as being the best way, um, you know, of moving these guys or gals um, on the ice. Uh, what I recommend and I go over with all of our EMTs is we do a log roll with a push maneuver um, in order to move an athlete from the prone position to the supine position. And what that log roll with a push is, um, real quick, is, you know, our critical care triangle is made up of an A man, a B, a C, and a D person, all right? Uh, the A person is always in control of the head, all right? Uh, with the commands of the A person, uh, what is done, okay, the typical log roll wouldn't have this lady right here, okay? But with the log roll push, she's in this position to kind of help push up the log roll with the assistance of these two EMTs here. So she kind of coordinates or kind of, you know, makes sure that the movement's as smooth as possible, all right? Uh, but any way you do it, uh, you can go on one, two, three, go, on three. It's all about how you coordinate it with your group or who you work with, okay? So as I mentioned, we get together with EMTs and talk about this all the time, and we, we came to the conclusion that a stable athlete in the prone position, if we want to move them over to supine, we're going to be doing a log roll with a push. And as I mentioned, she controls it all the way up, and then she'll control him all the way back down as well. All right, talk a little bit about helmet removal. We, we discussed it real quick. Uh, you know, taking the face mask off would not be one of my first go-tos when it comes to a, a potential cervical spine injury um, on ice. And the reason being, again, is those loose-fitting helmets. All of our guys are not wearing the best-fitted helmet, so unfortunately, removing the hat is often your best move, um, especially if time is, is critical. In order to remove the helmet, it's very similar to football. Uh, we're going to make sure that our B man or B person is going to make sure he comes in or she comes in and gains full control of the athlete. Now, in this position here, he doesn't have his fingers all the way around the head yet, but you want to make sure the A person says, or the, excuse me, the B person says when he, he fully has control of the head. Because once the B person says that, the A person can now remove the hat, making sure to mention you're clearing the ears. It's very important with football to say that, but with hockey too, you don't want to, you want to make sure that you know the cervical spine doesn't move at all when we when we come across the ears. Once the helmet is removed, the A person then controls the head again, and then the B person will then let go. And at this point, we'll pack and fill all voids, okay, to make sure we are trying to uh, create as much um, cervical spine neutral as possible. And we pack and fill. Everyone has a towel. I carry a towel on me all the time on the ice, but all of my emergency kits have pack and fill towels in them ready to go um, in this situation so we can pack and fill all voids um, because remember with the shoulder pads on here we want to make sure we have a uh, good cervical neutral position for this athlete. And when the helmet comes off we want to make sure that the C collar goes on. Now this might be something that's different for a lot of you depending on EMT guidelines, what state you're in and all that fun stuff. but. Uh, you know, most of the time, and I had this conversation with the EMTs when they came over and we went over all this stuff with them, uh, they were okay with the cervical spine collar going on, uh, but there, and it's probably a, 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 a conversation that we definitely don't have enough time to talk about right now, uh, but just know your guidelines, know your EMTs, know what they want to do. What, the gist I got was if it's on when we get there, we're going to leave it on, okay, or if it gets put on, it's staying on. Um, you know, you just got to know what's going on in your state, and you got to be familiar with it. But in, in most most situations, if the helmet comes off, it's, it, it is recommended that a C collar should go on. An interesting position we may have is if an athlete goes into the boards. All right, uh, a couple different ways they could go into the boards. Here's one if they go side to side, but here's an interesting one here too. Really, the situation doesn't change. The A man is in control. He's going to control the head here, and then it's very important that our rest of our critical care triangle grabs pieces of the athlete that is down that are not going to move. All right, And I stress that a lot because we want to make sure we're not grabbing jerseys, we're not grabbing pads. We want to get a good hold on the athlete's shoulders, the athlete's hips, and even the skates, obviously being very careful of the, uh, the, the blades. All right, We want to make sure we have a hold on areas that we can pull and move that aren't going to shift. If we start grabbing jerseys and we start grabbing you know, shoulder pads and whatnot, uh, we're going to get a lot of extra movement especially if you're dealing with some you know, younger um, players um, and the equipment isn't fitting too right or the jersey's very loose, uh, you want to make sure you're holding on to something that's not going to be you know, shook around a lot. So always grab from the shoulders, hips, uh, legs, or skates. 
All right. In this position, all we would do is coordinate an effort where we pull the athlete away from the boards, and then we're right in our position where we were here, uh, excuse me, with our, our prone to supine switch. All right. So once we get them away from the boards, again, one, two, on go, we're going to pull them out. One, two, three, go. It's a coordinated effort get away from the boards, and then we're able to flip them over to the supine position where we can continue our assessment. Another situation that could come would be a man out position in the net. All right, the, It could be the other way around where their skates may be in the net as well, but uh, it's the same as man out and boards. The, the C-spine control is gained by the A-man. Um, our critical care triangle, our B, C, D, E, F, however many you have, are going to come and help control the shoulders, hips, and skates. All right and we're going to control and move this person out of the net, where then we can then shift them from a prone position to the supine position with our, our log roll and push maneuver. Um, is the player caught in the net? Um, we could cut the net if we wanted to. I would we probably wouldn't do that unless we really, really needed to. Uh, but in a situation where it needed to be cut, we can definitely cut the person out of there. Or can the net be moved? Uh, lots of situations, probably not in this situation because his, his head is resting right in the back of it, um, but if there's a position where he's just in the net, we can lift that right off its, um, right, up, right up and move it right out of the way, and then, again, we're in the same position we were with our, our simple log roll with a push. And then we're going to transfer to rigid support, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. All right, man out transfer to boards. There's been a lot of talk about this, um, as with the cervical collar going on. Um, the main thing that we ran into with our EMT review was the use of a scoop stretcher versus a long board. Uh, you can see the scoop stretcher here, and there's another piece of it actually going underneath them. Excuse me, our, our EMTs uh, in, in, in this area of the state of New York uh, want to go with the scoop stretcher. Uh, and the only reason being is it's a little easier to use um, than the long board. All right, the traditional log roll onto the board, you got to worry about this thing slipping out, and uh, you know sometimes that can be a little bit too much, especially if you don't have enough people. So the EMTs, and there was just, it was me, and there was four other people, they brought in the scoop stretcher, and what this does, it kind of comes in from both sides and kind of clamps in. So here's one side of the clamp here, and it'll actually attach to the other side. And the protocol that we have here is we would use a scoop stretcher to lift the athlete up onto the gurney, and then the scoop stretcher would be removed. So the scoop stretcher is only being used as a transfer device. All right? They're not going to be taken to the hospital on the scoop stretcher. Uh, it's only going to be used to transfer that athlete from the ice up onto the gurney, which would be brought out um, onto the ice next to the athlete. All right, So it's very important as you go over these things with your EMTs, um, or, or anybody for that matter, or any sport, make sure you have that conversation about you know, the scoop stretcher and, and when it's best used over the longboard. Uh, we talked a little bit about the, about the log roll versus the flat lift. Here's a good picture of, uh, look, we have one, two, three, four athletic trainers, which is very nice, and an EMT. You know, but how often are we going to have that? Maybe in a situation with football, we may have upwards of three to four athletic trainers to work with. But if you're in a, a small high school practicing by yourself, you, know, you may be the only athletic trainer for both teams. So it's, it's vitally important that while you read the research, th this does provide the best um, best, best to limit the amount of cervical spine movement, excuse me, um, but is it practical? Not always practical. I'm not going to do this at practice, um, but you know, it, it depends on your setting and, and who you have there to help. Um, in the NHL, they may be doing stuff like this, but you know, they have a lot of people um, in the back ready to go if they need it. So uh, just know what you're doing and be cautious about reading the research and what's the best. All right, and then obviously practice, practice, practice. It's very important that you go over all this stuff because when it comes to transferring on ice, that slippery surface is not easy to work on. Um, and it's very important that you get as much practice with this as possible. For different goalie scenarios, a lot of these scenarios uh, don't change uh, that much compared to um, our man out position. The main difference being that equipment we've already talked about. All right, so here again, we have an athlete that's in the prone position. We obviously, and again, it's a stable position. This person's talking to you, and we're just, you know, we have a question mark about the cervical spine, all right? So one of the first things you want to do with a goaltender when you want to log roll him or her is we're always going to log roll away from the face mask, very similar to football, okay? Um, hand placement's all the same, similar to football, palms together, thumbs down, um, rolling away from the mask. With the goalie, as we talked about before, it's very important we take off that those big 
bulky blockers that they have on their legs. Um, it's, it's possible to log roll them with that um, attached. However, it's probably best, and we've seen the least amount or the easiest amount of movement um, when it's removed. Okay, there's less, you can actually grab onto the legs, I guess is where I'm getting at, um, and not necessarily holding on the pads. Uh, you can kind of see, if you look really closely here, you can see how this pad is actually still attached to the front part of this toque like I talked about before. We want to make sure we remove that so we're not you know, pulling any equipment around or having anything dangle that doesn't need to be there. All right, uh, It's important as the A-man controls the head, we're going to remove the blocker, we're going to remove the, um, the glove from the athlete, All right, and we're going to do a simple log roll with a push. We talked about it before. I wonder if any of you guys are seeing it now and girls out there, look at all of them grabbing the jerseys here. As I was putting this together, I was like, oh, we didn't really have good hold there. But I, I would strongly urge you not to, especially this one maybe, and these ones are okay here, but there's little loops on the back of their, their pants that they use to hang their pants up. I, I would stray away from grabbing those. But making sure we're grabbing shoulders, we're grabbing hips, we're grabbing the legs, and in a coordinated effort um, ordered by A, we're going to lift the athlete up to parallel and pause. Okay. We got our uh, D person here who is controlling it up, the push, and then we're going to lower them back down so they're in the supine position where then we can continue our treatment as needed. All right. Goalie helmet removal. Uh, this is the same way that we remove the helmet on the man out position. The reason why I wanted to show this was because, as we talked about before, this traditional mask, it might not be like this. So you may have a goalie if you have that bucket style helmet you may have to take it off the same way you did the man out uh, player as well. Uh, same thing, A person's in control, B person goes in. Once the B person has full control, the A person can remove the helmet. Okay, We switch, and then the A person then, then has control of the head again. And then at this point, we would pack and fill all voids with our towels. All right? Some of you are probably thinking, well, wait a minute. You told me that there's a different way and an easier way to take this off, and there is. Like we talked about before, these straps, it's not the same It's not the same helmet, but the same style helmet here. Uh, these five straps can be cut or unbuckled, uh, in which case that piece would be left back here and the whole front part could be lifted right off their head. In the sake of time, I would definitely go down the road where you do this rather than that, but please understand that you may need to do um, or can do uh, this specific movement as well um, if need be. And same as before, helmet comes off, seat collar comes on. For our goalies, a, a good point that I want to make sure we brought up too, uh, I know we're running a little bit low on time here, so I'm going to make sure we have enough time for some questions, but uh, the access to the carotid pulse is very important for a goalie, especially with this traditional helmet. The helmet comes down to protect the neck this way. And this It makes it extremely difficult. To find the carotid pulse in general, it can be difficult um, if you haven't done it, uh, but with a goalie's helmet like this, um, it can be very, very difficult to get the carotid pulse. So in certain situations, make sure, make sure you're aware of that because it might be a situation where you have to cut out the back before you can access the pulse. Goalie transfer to board, no change from the man out transfer to board. The only main, um, you know, the only main difference that we have is just all that equipment, that bulky equipment. Once we remove all that equipment that may hinder the process, the glove, the blocker, the lower body pads, um, it makes it a lot easier, all right? Um, but again, make sure not to grab too much jersey or equipment because that can make people slide. It can make the shoulder pad shift. Um, so make sure you're grabbing areas that um, aren't going to move very much. And real quick, uh, another point for the transfer of board that I want to make sure I bring up um, is that 30-degree rule. Which I apologize. I want to go back and make sure I talk about that. This 30-degree rule is very, very important when we're transitioning a man out position or a goalie onto a board. Uh, with with um, sports like football, lacrosse, any sport or even basketball, we're on a surface that's not as slippery uh, as ice. Uh, you would typically bring that log roll up to about 45 degrees, all right, where the board would then be put in. With hockey, it's very important. 30 degrees is actually recommended only because by lifting it up a little bit, if we go up too high, we run that risk of the body slipping out. So research shows that um, that 30 degree lift is recommended uh, rather than the full 45, um, again, just because there's minimal chance for the athlete to slip out um, 
you know, and there's more control that you have over the athlete at that time as well. Uh, again, goalie in the net, it may happen. Ironically, he's in the same position the other guy was, but nothing changes. Uh, the same goes for the man out in boards or man out in net. A man's in control, and everyone else kind of helps pull him out. Uh, we can cut the net if we need to, or we can move the net as well if we need to as well. But once we get that athlete away from the net, uh, we can then go into our log roll with push remover, maneuver or whatever maneuver you guys and girls have practiced and are, are familiar with and comfortable with. All right, our full crash scenarios. Now these are different things. I'm going to go through these real quick because, again, a lot of these topics are, 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 are for a different day or for more time. But full crash scenarios can be very scary, but it, it's where we want to make sure we have as much preparation and, and organization as, as possible for these different situations. And we want to make sure our primary objectives drive everything we do. All the research out there explaining when to remove the helmet, do this, then that, but then that, you know, all that is great, but a lot of people don't realize that as long as we make sure we keep our primary objectives in our, you know, front window, everything will be okay. Our primary objectives are cardiac, airway, breathing, and maintaining neurological status throughout the whole time. Quick example of this, you know, if we have a cardiac issue, obviously we want to get to the chest immediately. But if the person's breathing, you know, they're talking to you, you know, is the chest really a problem? Do we need to worry about the shoulder pads? No. Only worry about equipment that is getting in the way of your primary objectives. And real quick, cardiac, if, if, if we have an issue where we have a, a, a hockey player that's down and we need to access the chest, it's very important that we cut a T in the jersey starting at the neck and going down. All right. Um, as you can see here, these practice jerseys are a lot thinner than our our game day sweaters are, uh, but you want to start from the top going down. Obviously, we don't want to start from the bottom and cut up through the, to, towards the neck, uh, but we want to start going down. Be very careful, though, because as we cut, you want to make sure you got a, a good pair of scissors that are going to cut through sometimes a very thick collar that could be on some of these game day or game day jerseys so that you can cut a full T going down, but then also down the entire length of the arms so that when we remove this jersey, we're not getting anything caught on the arms. It's also very important to point out at this point, a lot of our guys will wear shirts underneath their pads as well. Those also should be removed um, when the straps of the pads have been removed as well. And then as the, the tee is cut in the jersey, you know, the shoulder pads are exposed. We can cut those different straps that we talked about a little earlier. And, and you know, if we need to, we flip it up, the, or excuse me, flip the, the, the chest protector up and we have immediate access to the chest. And again, whether that's for compressions, AED applications, whatever it may be, we'll have uh, immediate access at that point. Airway, most likely, I told you, they don't fit correctly, okay? But we can cut all those straps if we need to to remove that face mask. Face mask can be swung up, but not necessary because it can get in the way. It can become a fulcrum, and we just don't want it to be there, um, especially when transporting the athlete. If it needs to be done immediately for a quick airway um, access, that's fine. Uh, but we want to make sure if we're flipping up the, the face mask for a situation where the airway needs to be accessed immediately, eventually either the helmet or the face mask should come off before the athlete is transported to the hospital. All right, and again, once ventilations are confirmed, the helmet face mask should be removed. Breathing, uh, if a C-spine injury is assumed, the manual jaw thrust maneuver should be used to open the airway. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Uh, we want to make sure, again, another topic for a different day, but as I talked about before, making sure we have a, a very good crash bag, very good access to different things that we may need. Uh, I would highly suggest OPAs are huge. I mean, they're, very, they're so cheap, um, but these are such a vital uh, piece of emergency equipment that all of you should have in your, your, um, your kits because if you're ever in a situation, again, like I am, even at the collegiate level and practice by yourself, if you have an athlete that you just can't, the manual jaw thrust isn't working, you know, either the coach isn't able to do it or you know, the tongue just keeps falling back, these OPAs are fantastic to, to hold the tongue back. Um, so I would highly suggest looking uh, into those, less than 50 cents a piece for those. Um, we should all be using bag um, BMVs for ventilations. It's all in our practice. We shouldn't be using our pocket masks anymore. Um, and a suction device. Again, if you're by yourself and an athlete begins, be, begins to vomit, do we need to roll them over? You get a manual suction device like this, and we can manually suck out any saliva, vomit, any blood, anything that may be um, in the athlete 
athlete's mouth that could compromise the airway could be removed with uh, just a couple of simple devices. And as I said, neurological status, this should always be addressed from the, from the very beginning to the very end, um, but making sure we're going in order from the C all the way down to the N. All right, I think I'm going to just quickly go over to the overview because we're running out of time. I want to make sure I have time for some questions. Uh, in, in conclusion, EMS, they're, they're not accustomed to the ice. Um, a lot of the EMTs that I worked with were very open and, and, and actually thanked thank me for having them out to do this because they don't normally get that opportunity to go out there and practice these things. So I, I can't you know, urge you all enough to coordinate reviews with your EMS, uh, your support staff, and any student workers that you may have because um, the more you rehearse these things, uh, the more they flow, the more easier, um, and the more organized it just is in those worst case scenarios. Um, always follow your primary objectives approach. Uh, I know we didn't touch a lot about that with uh, the lack of time that we had for this presentation, but your primary objectives are vitally important and they drive everything that we do uh, from an emergency standpoint to make sure it's as organized as possible. Um, solidify your critical care triangle. I hope everyone has an emergency action plan out there in place, but if you don't, start thinking about one. If you don't, I would definitely start thinking about your critical care triangle. Your critical care triangle can be made up of players for practice, I have players and coaches there on my critical care trial triangle. For games, it's, it, it's not the coaches so much because they're obviously coaching, but EMTs, administrators, anyone who's going to be there to help you in those situations, to either bring a kit for you or someone you know that you might be able to walk through a basic log roll. And then finally, review and send to EAPs um, and share them with your visiting certified athletic trainers. Uh, this is a something that I've taken up just this year. I've made it a goal of myself that I, I want to try to make uh, emergency action plans as consistent as I can across the board. You, you know, like I said before, if you come to any of our home games at Bill Gray's, I'll, if for Nazareth College, I'll guarantee, um, you know, very smooth, hopefully, um, or at least organized and professional, um, you know, attack, I guess, of any sort of situations that may come up. But it, it's a very interesting point that, you know, why not make these conference-wide plans consistent across the board? You know, that way when you go to another conference team down the road, or even if it's in New Jersey or wherever it may be, you know that your same procedures, your same equipment, everything is going to be there that you may need. Um, NHL, NFL, all these teams are doing it now, and I don't see why you know you, you can't start doing it for um, college, high school, and so on and so forth. All right, uh, I know I kind of went through that very fast. Uh, here is my email address. Please feel free to reach out to me with any questions that may not be brought up at the conclusion of this. Uh, Mike's email is right here, um, and I, I appreciate everyone's time um, in listening to my presentation, and I, I wish you all very happy holidays and a happy new year. Okay, Pete, thank you very much for that. Um, we did have some questions come in, if you have well, a minute to stick around here. Yeah, for sure. Um, for, for those of you attendees, I, I know that we plan on as close to the one hour mark as we can, um, but inevitably questions come up and, and we run over a little bit. So if you do have to go, I understand the time commitments uh, that everybody has in this profession. So if you do have to check out, I understand that. Uh, if you do have a couple extra minutes, you could have some interesting questions to, uh, that, that came across that we can pose. So please feel free to, to stick around for a, a little bit of a Q&A while we have Pete on the line. If you need to check out, we, uh, we understand that as well. Uh, the, the one thing that, that came up was actually a, an, an issue, uh, a question that I had. Uh, we spent a lot of time last month reviewing the scoop stretcher protocol, and we did it relative to football. So I found it very interesting in your presentation that you uh, were reviewing the scoop stretcher relative to, to ice. And I'm curious to know, we, we found the scoop stretcher protocol to be extremely difficult with a football player on grass and on turf. And the primary reason for that was that the blades of the scoop stretcher got driven down into the turf, and we weren't actually able to close it. Mm -hmm. um, and it made it very, very challenging. I'm wondering, how, how did it go for you when you practiced that on the ice? Did you have any issues with getting it closed, or, or was it a, a very viable protocol for you? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. We, we actually did run into a couple, uh, not issues, um, obviously going over it, we wanted to make sure we, we took care of those as soon as possible, but um, the, the main problems that we saw with that is not necessarily with the scoop stretcher. If, if any athlete is laying on the ice for an extended amount of time, you can obviously assume that 
uh, their body heat is going to start you know melting or you know creating some moisture between them and the ice surface themselves so actually the the main limitation that we found with the scoop stretcher was when it might be kind of similar to maybe what you're talking about as we were going underneath the athlete uh, we, we tended to get a little resistance from the you know the sticking of the athletes jersey pads uh, you know going through that uh, but you know honestly though I, as far as the attachment or where the scoop stretcher actually clipped, I, we really had no issues with it. Um, you know, after pushing through some of that resistance that we had with, like I said, that freezing of the jersey, um, it, it really was. It really worked well, actually. And in, in conversations with the EMTs, um, because I know me and Mike have had conversations about the scoop stretcher in football in the past, I had kind of asked them about their take on it and. and as I mentioned before about all these different protocol changes with EMTs, they basically said, you know, that's kind of what we're doing now, you know. Yeah. So, you know, it's one of those things where you want to make sure you know what they're doing because, you know, unfortunately, whether you may want to or not, it might be what they're going to do. Um, but to answer your question, Mike, we really, it really actually worked well. Other than, like I said, that stickiness where just initially getting it underneath where you may run into that in any sport where it's getting caught on the jersey, but... Um, Again, it just comes down to practicing and, and using it as much as possible. No, that's that, that's very interesting. I hadn't I hadn't even thought of that when when we were making some conclusions on the scoop stretcher that that the ice may prove uh, completely different. So I, that's interesting. I'm glad you brought that up. Right, and, uh, and real quick, and too, they they also said really the only reason why they were using the scoop stretcher was to transfer the athlete from the right. from the ice to the gurney. So. Yeah, we get that a lot. A lot of the paramedics will will say that this we use the scoop stretcher only as a transfer device, and Correct. not a transport yep. device. Yeah, exactly. Get that a lot. Um, now, as far I, one other thing I had that I thought was interesting, you had mentioned that the goalie helmet can be a significant barrier to finding the carotid pulse. Um, and and as you know, when we're going through our programs in the, in the summer and stuff, oftentimes we talk about how the football helmet is a barrier to performing the modified jaw thrust. I'm, I'm curious to know your take on, the, does the goalie helmet interfere with your ability to get a, a good modified jaw thrust like the football, like a football helmet does? Yes. I mean, they, it tends to be a little bit better only because, unfortunately, the ill-fitting of the hockey Helmets in general. I mean, they're a little, they're they're much looser, more loose than your traditional football fit or game day fit would be. Uh, so, is it difficult? It, it 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 is without the appropriate practice. But is it more obtainable than the you know the manual jaw thrust with a 360 helmet for football? Yes, I think it's much easier because those cheek pads and the football helmet are pushing down so much so much tighter than um, any of our helmets are on hockey players. So while the, the carotid pulse is difficult to find, I really didn't have much difficult, or we didn't have much difficulty um, getting a good manual jaw thrust with the goalie helmet on. But depending on the types of helmets, if, if I go back to that old school helmet that our first goalie was wearing, that was a bit more difficult too because of how far down his mask went. So it, it depends on the helmet, but you know, when comparing it to the football uh, realm, I, I think it's much easier personally. Okay. Interesting. All right. Uh, another question that came in is, uh, I think this goes back to our, our pack and fill approach to things. If you only remove the helmet uh, from a player, uh, would you place towels or padding under the head to take up the space uh, that is created by removing the helmet if you don't remove the shoulder pads? 100%, definitely. And anytime, anytime we want to remove... Um, the hat. I mean, you go back to the all or none uh, principle. You know, if you take one off, you should take everything off. But if we go back to our primary objectives, you know, if 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 the athlete has a pulse, okay, we're not worried about the chest right now, obviously, but we're worried about them breathing. You know, it, it's one of those things you gotta you gotta go through your primary objectives and you gotta know what you're what you're dealing with. Okay, so I guess not to get ahead of the question, would I pack and fill definitely? Because if I was to remove the helmet. All right, and right now in that situation, the chest was not something that I was worried about. I would not worry about removing everything, and I would simply pack and fill all voids. And so again, yeah, using padding, um, towels, uh, anything that you have that can um, ace wraps, anything that you can kind of stuff between 
the back of the neck, back of the head, and the ice, I think would be um, more than sufficient to uh, make sure we're in good cer cervical neutral position. And I know we didn't have a lot of time to really talk about um, how we access cervical neutral and all that different fun stuff, but um, I, I, I highly would recommend yeah, packing and filling all voids with towels or anything you may have is, is, is essentially important and should be done if the helmet's removed and the shoulder pads are still in place. All right, now you've had uh, a number of years now with you know working with hockey and experience working with hockey. So, do you wear anything on your shoes uh, to help you? So even though you have experience getting out onto the ice and probably could do it nine out of ten times without falling, but is it is there anything that you wear on your shoes to help you get a better grip, just to keep yourself safe while you're out there? Oh yeah, definitely. Actually, I think we might have a picture on here I can show you real quick. Uh, I definitely do, and the reason why you can kind of see them here. I I, I like to wear. Um, they're called micro spikes. Um, I, I think they're good to have because, and there's lots of different variations of them. I'm just the type of person when something happens, I'm jumping over and I'm running out there. I'm not waiting for a referee or a player to come over and escort me there. Um, see if I can find another better picture. You know, I like to have them on because I can get there faster. You can see them again here. Um, so yeah, Mike, I do. I do like wearing things on my feet because I feel like I'm not waiting around. And you know, when it comes down to getting somewhere as quickly as possible. It's, it's very important to do it as quickly and as safely as possible. And I don't want to be that guy who slips and falls on my butt too in front of everybody. So, or if I'm running towards somebody, slip and fall and you know, go right into the boards or something. So yes, I, I definitely, I, I've always worn um, different treads on my, on my shoes to make sure I, I'm as, as stable as possible. Okay. Well, great. Um, I appreciate your time and, and sticking around a little bit to answer some of these questions. Um, but but I, I do think it's time to let you go um, and, and to let everybody else go as well. Um, I'm going to just remind everybody uh, that our next uh, Sports Emergency Care white paper session in this slide here, let me, um, if I can, I'm just going to switch back over. I updated the slide here a little bit while you were while you were talking to make sure our, our dates were correct. Um, but our next sports emergency care session will be uh, Monday, January 30th, where we're going to talk more specifically about how to find a pulse. So some of these issues that we talked about with helmets getting in the way and those types of things can can be a challenge to us finding a pulse. But there's actually a technique um, that one of our para that our paramedic Peter Bonadonna has has uh, kind of enlightened me to in terms of being able to find a pulse more effectively, there is actually a technique rather than just putting your hand over the uh, the radial pulse area or the carotid pulse. So we'll talk about how uh, better technique can help us make sure that we're more accurate in assessing our pulses. So we'll do that on Monday, January 30th, just as a reminder for everyone. And then remember our sports emergency care uh, series also includes the informational Friday series. Um, which you can find on uh, our YouTube channel. So I want to uh, give everybody an opportunity uh, or a reminder to follow us on YouTube for updates on when new content is available, including the recording sessions uh, from our Sports Emergency Care White Paper series. Uh, and that concludes it for today. So I want to take an opportunity to thank you, Pete, for your time and your expertise in sharing that with us. And I want to thank everyone who logged in and joined us this afternoon. And I hope you found this to be very informative. And we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Take care.